Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Georgina. I've seen most of you, you know, repeat offenders. I've seen you before. Welcome to this afternoon's Global Frictions event. It's the last one for this year, and it has been an enormous pleasure to present these panels every month. And I think um, you'll agree, those of you who have been coming regularly, that it's been a fantastic and successful program this year. We've covered a wide variety of topics. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Wurundjeri and the Boonwurrung people of this area. And I'd also like us to remember that the land was stolen and not ceded. And I think if we stand here, and I often say this, but I, I think it's very poignant to look down uh, Swanston Street here and remember that along these roads were creeks and little meeting places and all kinds of social spaces that were here before we occupied this land. So. Um, when I look down there, I see um, Latrobe with his funny hat and the pigeons sitting on top. Uh, and it really reminds me of that imposition of people on this land. So, which brings me to the topic tonight, social resilience. So unfortunately, it's been a very great struggle in Australia to achieve social resilience. So I think we've got a lot to learn from this topic in our speakers tonight. I'm gonna hand over to Charlie um, in a moment, but I just wanted to say uh, thank you for coming along to these sessions and I wanted to say it's been a wonderful experience uh, as director of the centre this year. I've really enjoyed that experience. As some of you might know, we're transitioning to a new structure next year, but we will definitely be continuing with the Global Friction Seminars. Uh, so we will continue our intellectual education and we also have some reading lists for you just in case you feel a little bit abandoned over December and January. Um, we know how much you need to read. So get online, have a look at the reading lists and the materials and the other things that Beck, standing there taking photographs, <laughs> has sent out. I'd also like to acknowledge the support that I've had this year in organising these events uh, from Beck, Carol Bell. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> uh, it's been wonderful. And also Michelle Farley, who's not here tonight, but she's also behind the scenes been doing a lot of the organising. I'd like to acknowledge the great support that we've had from AV and from the um, technical departments at RMIT, um, proving that a University of Technology can do technology. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the fantastic support that I've had from the exec. Uh, we had our um, final exec um, today. Uh, for the current structure and um, I felt incredibly well supported and I think it's really spoken to the democratic aims of our centre that in that decision making process I felt very connected with the members. So thank you all, members and exec and support staff. It's been fantastic and I'll hand you over to Charlie. Thanks very much. Jeffrey. Welcome. Everybody, I say everybody. There's a hardcore element here that I'm really happy to see. So thank you for, for coming out this evening. Um, my name's Charlie, I'm Charlie Hunt. I'm a senior research fellow here in the Center for Global Research. Um, but before I say any more about me or our plans for tonight, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Um, on which the university stands and, and where we meet. And um, I've enjoyed hearing from Georgina at each of these sessions some of the stories about the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people and the meeting point that this represents. And I think it really is a, a neat kind of thing that we're able to meet here to discuss things which we don't always agree upon, but that um, we need to find ways ahead on in a place which has that kind of history as well as the history that, that Georgina mentioned. So. I respectfully recognise elders past, present, present and imagine too. Um, very quickly with my time, I'm going to give a few introductory comments, a scene setting if you like, um, to get us into our discussion. Um, I'll then introduce a bit more about our panel members and, uh, and then we'll launch into what will be a discussion that I'll try and facilitate amongst the three up here. Before too long, we'd like to open it up in order to have a discussion, chance for questions, but also comments and clarifications from the floor. So this topic, as Georgina said, questions around resilience responses and, and uh, capacities to respond to violence and escalation of conflict cuts across 
really the range of issues we're interested in at the centre. So our thematic interests in issues of conflict, development and governance all have significance around these questions. Um, what we want to address today is a fundamental question really and it's what is it, what specifically is it that enables some communities to resist violence in the face of significant socio-political volatility. So, in other words, how do people maintain everyday types of security and social order in contexts where there's severe or intense stress on, on those contexts? So-called urban environments, we're trying to tackle specific questions around that as well today. And I say so-called because I think hopefully we'll get into a discussion about what urban even means and what it leaves out when we, when we talk about it in those terms. But on the one hand, they offer succor, um, support to, to many and kind of constitute sites of rich diversity and opportunity. But on the other hand, these spaces are also places of contestation, um, of inequality, and have potential for escalation and spiral into different forms of conflict and potentially violent conflict as well. So we see in these places co-location of profound difference, this kind of notion that side by side people live different ways and, and different practices. This can be destabilizing, it's not necessarily, but it can be. They're also a center of gravity often for, um, for vulnerability, if you like. So um, I read today a UNHCR report that said 60% of all displaced peoples in the world live in cities, not in camps, not in these kind of images that we see. And, and that's often IDPs, but also, um, sorry, 60% of the refugees of the world, 80% of IDPs live in cities. So this is, this is significant. There's, 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 on the one hand, um, positive opportunity in urban environments, but, but we do see the, the potential for destabilization. So despite all of this, some towns, some cities, these urban locales that face extraordinary pressures, nevertheless remain relatively stable. Why and how? That's what we want to get into a bit more today. So I'm not going to try and give a definition of social resilience or try to unify our, all of us around one thing, but one, one common um, statement on this topic, if you like, is that communities that display social resilience have the ability to absorb threats more easily than those that do not. So in quite simple terms, I'm talking about some sort of absorption capacity. And the last thing I want to say is that I think in many parts of the global south, which is the other sort of indicator of our focus today, in many parts in the, in the global south, but also I would argue in large parts in the north, um, and in the context of intensifying urbanization, this absorption capacity is not always legible. It's not always visible, it's not always tangible and understandable to those of us who come our analysis comes through a particular lens and particular ways of understanding the world. Um, what I think we find is an, a range of alternative forms of dispute resolution and violence mitigation, these mechanisms and capacities that also are fluid and dynamic and travel and are interpenetrated and, and evolve over time. Um, they exist in something more akin to a kind of polycentric form of governance, something much more messy and difficult to, to disentangle and, and understand. It really challenges our ways of working in those places. So one of the main argument, counter arguments to this line, this, this set of arguments, is that we don't have an empirical base. We don't understand enough what this social resilience looks like, so how can we support it or how can we create it and build it? So with this in mind, Today, I think we've got two main aims. It's that key question I um, articulated earlier, but the first aim is to consider how these urban sites, towns, cities, and the former metropoles of colonial governance go about creating social order and containing violence. We're going to get our panelists to explore how these alternative and possibly some sort of new emergent forms of governance um, 
relate to urbanization? What is the relationship there, if there is one? And the second aim is to reflect on how outsiders, perhaps those from the global north, but actually, importantly, we need to reflect as well on those in political elites in the global south in the capitals of some countries where counterinsurgency operations are also planned from. There's, a, there's not a north-south divide that's quite so simple. But nevertheless, how do these somehow outsider responses work with the challenges of urban context and the nature of polycentric governance? So let me introduce to you those who are going to make all of this much clearer and, and help us through this, this difficult maze. I'm delighted to be able to introduce these three, both because they're fabulous people and excellent scholars. So um, first, let me introduce Dr. Joseph Hongo. Joseph's the director and, um, at the Peace and Conflict Studies Institute in Australia, Paxia. This is a not-for-profit organization based located in Brisbane. Uh, um, our other panelists also have involvement in, they conduct research and training in, in ver a range of areas, but conflict related, um, conflict analysis, transformation, and peace building. Joseph's research is broadly speaking in the politics of conflict management and resolution in post colonial settings. Um, but as well as an excellent scholar, Joseph comes to us with many years of working in local level, national level, regional governance. Uh, mechanisms and programs in peace building and conflict resolution in Africa. Certainly lots of rich experience there, but more recently in this region and neighborhood in, in Bougainville and before that, I think in the Philippines. So Joseph brings a lot to the table. We're happy to have you here, Joseph. Second, let me introduce Dr. Volker Berger. I've been uh, encouraged to get that right because for many years I've been bludgeoning my way through <laughs> Volker's name. Volker is an honorary research fellow in the School of Political Science and International Studies up in Brisbane at the University of Queensland. There's a lot I could say about Volker, but he's a self-styled peace researcher and historian, and he does those things with, with um, great um, grace and excellence. I, I think Volker's, in particular, having come from a background working in peace institutes, research centers in, in Germany and Switzerland for a long time. He moved to Australia. And ever since then, I've been fascinated to read his work, his impressive body of work, which is also very influential, I should add, um, on issues of post-conflict peace building and state formation, non-Western approaches to conflict transformation and issues to do with natural resource extraction, environmental degradation and conflict. Um, his expertise are in the Pacific Island countries, but we I had the pleasure of doing some work with Volker in Africa more recently as well, so I'm sure he can speak to that. And last, but by no means least, Associate Professor Anne Brown, who is a Principal Research Fellow here with us in the Centre for Global Research. Anne does fabulous work from a background working on human rights and dialogical approaches to some of this profound cultural difference I referred to earlier. Anne's works on questions of violence and conflict. Um, peace, governance, and social order in these heterogeneous environments or, or states. Last but not least, I'll say, or finally, I should say that all three are recently back from extensive field work, um, which goes back many years, but they're very recently, freshly back from trips. And they also happen to be going tomorrow, in Joe's case, Saturday, in Anne's case, and next week, in Volker's case, back to the very places that they'll be speaking to us about today. So fresh in the mind and, and ready to go again. Um, we have people with rich experience here today. So enough from me. I'm going to now sit down with them and, and begin with a question. So, does this one also work? Yeah, I'm more baritone with this one. Um, so to begin, I decided I would like to ask each of the, the panelists um, in 100 words or less, an impossible mandate, if, if you like, but nevertheless, something I'll try and stick to, keep them to. In 100 words or less, what is it that enables some communities to resist violence in the face of significant socio-political turbulence? We might begin with you, Anne. Okay. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> um, 
Okay, well, I think one of the very simple but fundamental steps in this is that in a lot of communities, um, people recognise, they take responsibility. There's a sense of taking responsibility for their own context, for their own um, well-being and security. Uh, that's one. There's, there's um, a, particularly if you're looking at cities, there's often a highly diverse, highly heterogeneous kind of landscape and people are prepared to work across that. They're often not highly centralised contexts, but a whole network, a whole web of interlinking exchanges, which doesn't mean they're highly... There's, there, there may not be high levels of trust, but there's a preparedness to interact um, and, and a habit of relationship, basically, a habit of maintaining relations and maintaining connections despite, uh, often across really quite profound difference and a preparedness to work with conflict in that sense. Thanks very much. Well done. Good example <laughs> to set for everyone. So taking responsibility and working across profound difference. Okay, a good start. Joseph, 100 words or less. Yeah, thanks. thanks a lot. I think I want to resist by saying that uh, 100 words is too little for me uh, coming from largely oral society. but. Um, in terms of why uh, do some uh, communities resist violence, I think there are two things that stand out a lot, is that um, there's the idea of what a community is. And every community you go to, there is the question of who we are as a community. Um, our history, our rituals, um, what we do for a living, um, what makes us a community, how we conduct our ceremonies. And I think this speaks to the idea of the, co the ability of the communities to imagine themselves and live as a community. And each community is different. So, um, so for example, with my background, if you say that I'm from Kisumu or Nairobi, there's an idea of what it means to be a person from Kisumu or Nairobi. The second thing is that um, resisting violence is not a one-off process. It's an everyday activity. Um, um, through the nature of greetings, for example, uh, you find that if you go to parts of Africa, people greet each other for about five minutes. Um, that is part of establishing relationships. How they conduct their ceremonies, it's an everyday process. Uh, who they know, where they work, how they get to work. So you find that all these different repertoires of building relationships are also uh, simultaneously ways of resisting violence so that when something happens that a bit uh, frictioning and a bit um, a tension, then they resort to these issues these cultures, these um, uh, repertoires to address the problem. Thanks very much, Joe. Yeah. Volker. Coming, coming from Germany and a German political science and social science background, I should contradict <laughs> Anne and <laughs> Joe and say, with Max Weber, it's about the monopoly over the legitimate use of physical force. It's the state. But since I came to Australia, and worked in the Pacific Island countries, I had to learn forgot about, forget about Max Weber and uh, the legitimate use of physical force monopolized in, in, in the state. Uh, it is not uniform, centralized structure that makes communities resilient, but it's uh, the grassroots everyday interactions across difference. So it's more fragmented, it's more heterogeneous, and it's not hegemonic, uh, uh, homologous homo and, and uniform as Max Weber has thought. A hundred words, I wasn't ready. <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone. So that, that's perfect. So just as I hoped, you've already identified a couple of key things that you all seem to agree on. Relationships, interaction, webs, networks of of interactions and a sense of self, an imaginary uh, self-perception, something about who we are and, 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 and what it is that we do, how we respond to violence. So now, in a more fair way, I'd like to give you a little more time to elaborate on, on some of those points, but particularly if you could use kind of illustrative examples from, from the places you've worked and that you know to unpack that a little further and really to, to, to ask about what it is 
that helps th these communities manage conditions that might lead to violence? And perhaps this time we can start with you, Joe. In unpacking this um, um, in terms of key examples, I'm, dr I'm always drawn to um, the relationship, in the, especially in a modern context, uh, whether you live in global north or global south, uh, between the owners of capital and the owners of labor. Um, in that you find that in most cases um, there is always a tension. And this tension is uh, partly um, uh, overlaid by the desire to produce order in a particular way and the reality that that order is always an aspiration as opposed to a reality. Um, and so as opposed to uh, something that can be achieved uh, through particular ways of doing things. So what emerges, for example, um, in, in, in parts of East Africa where I have been working extensively is that you find that um, this friction between owners of labor and owners of capital almost always produces tensions, but since those um, actors know each other. They have their own traditions. Uh, for the owners of capital, it is about profit making. It's about um, a control and everything. For the owners of labor, it is about um, a, um, resistance. Sometimes it's about um, trying to get something. They know each other. And through knowing each other, establishing those relationships, they learn to co-depend on one another. Um, they realize that um, if you are, if your only currency is labor, uh, then you have to depend on the person whose currency is, 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 is capital. If you want to expand, as Marx, uh, as, as, uh, um, as uh, Karl Marx would say, expand uh, the forces of production, then you realize that you have to depend on a particular organization of labor. So you find that, um, for example, in East Africa, where I've been working in Nairobi, for example, um, you do realize that there are ways in which people's cultures, traditions, and everything has permeated into how they relate with owners of capital as, um, in some cases, owners of labor has permitted into that, that what will emerge as friction, violence, and, 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 and conflict is somehow controlled by various ways of accepting each other's culture, traditions, and the relationship that, that has emerged uh, from that point. So a good example is that um, someone rocks up at work at 9 a.m. or 9.30, and the boss asked uh, him or her that, uh, why are you late? And he said, you know, um, I woke up in the morning and my uncle was very, very uh, um, um, ill or my, this something happened to me or, or the spirit didn't, I didn't wake up on the right spirit uh, this morning uh, or, or something that the, a, a true capitalist will not even accept. But you find that in that context, there's an acknowledgement that sometimes these forces that are beyond our control should be accepted within the context of capital as well. So we find that, that managing that relationship almost always over time build um, a, 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 a semblance of order and, 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 and resolving conflicts. Yeah. yeah, no, well, it, so I'm not thinking it's so much in terms of labor and capital and, and, and really more just, um, and this is a, an example from a very small city, so not, not anything like Nairobi, but just thinking of, of, of Port Vila, for example, in, in the Pacific, in Vanuatu, where, and, 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 and most of my connections, there are a lot of my connections around these issues are really um, around the Council of Chiefs and so forth, so it's not necessarily a whole view of even that small town, but, but, but there's, there's a, um, well, for example, there was um, a concern um, I hope this doesn't um, touch anyone here in the room, but there was a concern that people from a particular island were being involved in a, in a criminal, international criminal ring actually, also involving Vietnamese um, in New Caledonia who were um, uh, illegally shipping stuff and then selling it and stealing it and, and recycling it. And there were a people, people from Tana were seen to be involved in this. and. Um, and it going on for some years. And, and so um, the, the, the Council of Chiefs in Port Vila um, decided to, they, they called a number of chiefs from Tana over um, and they, they discussed what they do about this. And then they called all the key, there's, there's another whole arrangement in Port Vila where, where there are chiefs from every language group that help to manage the dynamics 
of what's happening in the town, help to manage security in the town. It, you know, it's up and down how well it works, but um, the Council of Chiefs called all the senior Tannies leaders within Port Vila together. They'd called the senior chiefs from the island. And then, in a sense, they had a big ceremony where they, where they um, celebrated all, all their achievements. They killed pigs. They gave gifts. And then they basically said, now you should need to all step aside and you're all being replaced. And they, the, the police were also there. There was a whole seat. That all, all these key people from the church, the police, the ministry, the government, were all part of this ceremony by which basically the whole Tannies management within Port Vila was completely renewed. Uh, as an F and how well, I don't know how well that controlled the criminal dynamic, but this was something that was organised by this, um, you know, it's not part of the government anyway. It has constitutional recognition, but it's not part of the government in that sense. That's just one example, but there are also, you know, following um, um, uh, the, the long conflicts in Solomon Islands, um, which part of the part of the dynamics around those conflicts was was the um, around land use and in the capital in Honiara. Uh, so again, there were in, in terms of Port Vila, a Ni Vanuatu response to that. There were um, um, the Council of Chiefs again. Uh, called, uh, sort of gathered people together to give um, recognition and, and thanks and appreciation to all the, all the traditional landowners around the city and, and sort of had this discussion with them. Don't, you know, if, if you're feeling under pressure, please talk to us, let us know. We don't want a Honiara type situation here. There, it's a very, there's a sort of an ongoing effort at managing reconciliation, an ongoing a sense that these relationships need to be maintained, we need to be looking ahead. That it, it doesn't have to be the Council of Chiefs, that's just one kind of organisation. But um, you can see a very proactive body of people. The, the interesting thing is, just picking up on, on the Port Vila example, that obviously institutions of governance and institutions to deal with conflict travel from the rural areas into the cities. So you mentioned Tana. Tana is an island in Vanuatu and a lot of people move from these outer islands to the capital city or to the main island and they bring their chiefs with them and all of a sudden you don't have only chiefs in the rural village context as you, as you would expect but you have chiefs, ta so-called town chiefs in Port Vila or in Port Moresby or other capital cities of, uh, of the Pacific Island countries, and I think it's similar in, in uh, African countries. So um, it's not so much the divide between the rural and the urban areas, but it's more the connections and the relations and this traveling back and forth. Um, and of course, uh, there are new challenges in an urban environment. So uh, the example that Anne gave was a very positive example, but you could also think about uh, difficulties which arise from difference, because when you have people coming from different islands or whatever tribal or ethnic or clan backgrounds, they also bring in their different traditions and their different customs. And so you have to somehow reconcile in these different customs. And dealing with difference is a challenge for, for customary approaches to conflict resolution. Another example that involves Tana people, for instance, in Port Vila was when there was a conflict over sorcery between the people from Tana and the people from Amrim. The Amrim people are very well known for their capacities to do sorcery. And there were people killed and so forth. And then um, both the police and the chiefs did not uh, succeed in dealing with this conflict at the beginning and when they wanted to do a reconciliation then they had the problem that you had two different customs. The Tana people wanted to swap women which is their custom for the people killed and the Ambrim people said this is not our custom. So uh, and then they also had to include somehow the police 
uh, as a modern state institution? How do you include modern state actors like the police or foreign businesses or uh, whatever into these customary approaches of reconciliation and b uh, rebuilding, rebuilding relationships? So I, I think there are different things here. There, there is uh, the, the, the possibility to, to also make use of non-state customary ways of conflict resolution and dealing with conflict. And on the, on the other hand, you have the problems that arise from this new urban environment. Okay. Thank you very much for those responses. Um, I think t t that leads us nicely into what I wanted to ask you next, but just to reiterate, I think this point Volker made about as much as the difference or the, the differences between somehow urban locales and rural or inside and outside, it's actually about the connections and the interpenetration and the cross-fertilization that, that occurs empirically when we, when we look. And so maybe um, I could kind of push you a bit further on each of those, but really around this question of urbanization in particular. So not just urban locales, but somehow a dynamic sense of changingness. <laughs> so intensifying urbanization perhaps. What does this set of challenges that you've raised and this set of dynamics, social order emerging out of the local context and the importance of relationships, how is that being affected, if at all, positively or negatively, by the issue of the idea of urbanization and perhaps an intensification in that urbanization? We're looking at quite different locales, so it may manifest very differently, but some thoughts on that would be great next. So perhaps, Anne, we could maybe start with you. Okay, but uh, as you say, locales are so different and the dynamics are so different that you know I'm conscious I'm speaking extremely generally. But um, there's such a layering of um, intensification, really, factors intensifying uh, friction. Um, so land issues are, are often just huge, um, particularly for societies where a lot of forms of social order are embedded in being from your place. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, then, then when you're away from your place, um, there can be a struggle to establish new forms of social order. They can flow on, they can flow on, but they may not. They can flow on via kinship mechanisms and so forth, but they may be transformed quite fundamentally. There's also, you know, the competition for land, um, uh, people being displaced from their, from their um, traditional lands in, in the urban area. Um, but then there's the really profound reordering of relationships that occur through different forms of employment, uh, you know, sort of um, new technologies, um, going back to your discussion about capital and labor, um, really profound reordering of relationships that, that intensifying capitalism um, brings into play. And then if you're looking at, you know, not so much uh, uh, Port Vila and so forth, but actually even Port Vila, places that become um, channel, places that become channels for um, major forms of commerce, and often those forms of commerce, um, they may be legal, but they're very often illegal. So, you know, uh, major drug trafficking sites, for example, um, money laundering, operating through cities, and then, sorry, I'm going on, but then the sort of marginalization of particular groups around that as well. So just thinking about that um, in, in northern Ghana, for example, the, the sort of some um, work we were doing in, in Kumasi, the marginalization of, of major communities um, that were seen as, as passes through in a way, although they've been there for some generations. So just a whole series of, you know, a, a reordering of relations, the generation of major inequalities uh, that really stretch, um, stretch forms of relations and require people to re-establish, rework those, those forms of interconnection. Thanks, Anne. Joe, we might come to you, but if you wanted to pick up again as part of your 
thoughts on what you said right at the beginning about what it means to identify with a particular community and what the question of urban even means to that, what it means to that imaginary. But exactly, anything yeah. else you wanted to pick up as well. And I think um, thinking of um, urban centers and um, um, social order broadly, um, um, I'm often um, um, kind of stuck at the question of uh, how does Nairobi as a city, for example, or Juba in South Sudan or Kinshasa, where I also worked, um, maintain a semblance of order and um, an idea of peace in so many ways comparatively. Um, even um, in a context whereby anybody who speaks about Nairobi will think it's almost um, near violence. Um, most of the time uh, you speak about Nairobi, you're going to Nairobi and somebody will ask you, ah, are you safe, are you secure? And it's so happened that personally I lived in, um, in the most dangerous parts of Nairobi at some point in my life. And at that time it didn't occur to me how security is maintained in some parts of Nairobi. And now when I go back uh, uh, from Australia, I go to Nairobi, I'm much more careful where I go to. Yet when I was there, I wasn't even asking myself whether there's some limitations or where I should go to. And it occurred to me that um, um, the idea of security in a place like Nairobi relies on so many um, for actors in different areas um, who sometimes combine working together and sometimes conflict uh, and, and, and fight over so many things. And um, um, it, the fact that um, the state attempts to provide security in the way of categorizing population in general um, is, co is somehow in competition with the local uh, ways of providing security in the city in sometimes what's called the militias, how they provide security because the militias or let me call them um, uh, the local security providers. They do provide security to the people they know. They say that we are providing security to, to our people. So the idea of what a community is. So you find that the police tries to provide security to the population. The local security providers frame security provision as to our people. Now, how does this relationship work? Sometimes you find that the police has to rely on this, our, this militias and other guys um, to make sense of who the population is that they're trying to govern or they're trying to, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to protect. So the police doesn't rely on the general idea of population that they're trying to protect. They are relying on the, non, the, the alternative structures of provision of security to make sense of what it means to govern some parts of Nairobi. And this reliance sometimes produces some order. Um, a number of times it can be chaotic and I'm reminded when I was working on a project called uh, Community Policing in Nairobi um, uh, that was funded partly by Safer World. And the word that was chosen to represent community policing was Toa Habariko Policy. In a positive sense, it means give the police information, contribute information to the police, inform the police. In other ways, give the police information to protect you. But the word Toa Habari is also in a way means remove information from somebody. So in a way, deny the police information. Um, uh, try to, so you find that whenever there was cooperation between the police and these alternative structures of prov providing security, whenever the, the, the dynamics was so positive, um, you will have a lot of Toa Habari to the police. So locals provide information to the police and things work. But when there is tension, there is also removing a body from the police, denying police information. And in both cases, you find that both giving police information and removing information from, from police will somehow produce security and order in different settings. And it's almost found it a bit complicated to unpack in that TOA and TOA TOA will mean security in different ways, even when in one case, the police are helpless because they don't have the information. In the other case, they have, they have more information, and in both cases, there's security. So I found it a bit challenging in, in, in urban centers, and it still goes on today in terms of the relationship between the formal security providers of security and the informal providers of security. Thanks. Thanks, Sherry. Yeah, Falker, Falker, before this you... This very nicely um, locks in with what I said in the beginning about the fragmented character of the provision of security. You said that... Uh, Yes, the security is provided for our own people, which means it is exclusionary. So it's for us, but not for them. And we have different means to secure our community. 
at the, sometimes working together with the police, sometimes withholding information, but it is not security as a public good as we think of security as ideally to be uh, implemented. And uh, the same thing, I think, can be said of um, uh, cap uh, big cities in, in, in the Pacific Island countries where I work. You always have these two poles. You have the squatter settlements or slums or whatever, where people most of the time provide for their own security, relying also on those institutions that traveled from the highlands or from the islands to Port Moresby or to Honiara or Port Vila and uh, the, the chiefs sometimes working together with the police, sometimes working uh, against the police, providing security for, for their people. But it's their people only. And then you have to build the relationships between the different communities. In, in Pacific Island countries, it's often very much identified along island lines. Maybe it's more ethnic lines or tribal lines in in, in Africa. I also wanted to say to Anne and the importance of land, what, what I always f find fascinating when you look at in, in, in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, US, you have big um, diaspora communities of Pacific Islanders. So they live in Brisbane or in Los Angeles and so forth. But when you ask them where do you come from? Then they give the name of the village or the island they come from in Samoa or in, in, in Tonga. So that uh, the, the, and, and the, the interaction between these islands and the diaspora communities in these big cities is very, very intense. And it's very much a temporal and cyclical uh, movement between uh, between the big cities and the islands, islands and the villages, and this maintains very much the connection to the land, which is so important for 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 the Pacific Island people, and I think for other people who come from a rural background. But question is, these are city dwellers who came in first generation, second generation. What will happen? what will happen next with the, with the young people. And this is where, when the trouble starts. Often the young are identified in the cities as the troublemakers because they are unemployed and uh, hang around, don't have much to do. And then you have this contradiction between the chiefs who uh, maintain that they have the right to send travel, uh, troublemakers back to the, to the village or to the island and the young people saying, no, it's my human right, uh, freedom of movement is guaranteed in the constitutions, I can stay in the city. And then you have, have these problems which are more problems between generations and not so much between uh, capital and labor, which mm -hmm. I can't really find in, in the environment uh, that I'm more familiar with, maybe in different forms, but not as a direct capital-labor interaction. Mm -hmm. And actually, can, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm also wanting to um, disagree just a little bit, Volker, around um, the fragmented, I mean, I accept that the, the nature of the, the security provision is highly fragmented in many respects, but, um, and that people are providing security to their group to some extent, but I think in a lot of environments that, um, in, in many environments, not and certainly not all. There are there are people and 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 bodies, as it were, that do a lot of cross-sectional intersecting, uh, and also people adjust and shift adjust to this new complex environment. Um, so I, I can think of people, for example, um, someone. This is just an individual case, but I don't think it's an unusual case. Move, living in Dili feeling um, very insecure for quite good reasons, away from his uh, village, um, not being able to call on kin connections, uh, certainly not being able to rely on the police in, in his situation, but really developing networks around his neighbourhood uh, to some extent through church connections. Okay. And, and, yeah. and, 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 you know, that, sorry, that's just one, one example. but. But you know, people who do a lot of linking between communities, who are conscious of this um, dynamic of you know one language group or another language group, and who want to put effort into 
ameliorating those tensions. Wait, wait, hold, it's, hold, it's, Volker, it's, Volker, it's, hold, hold, hold. Joe, Joe wants in. <laughs> Both of you. Um, <laughs> and and, and uh, Volker talked about, and I'm sorry if I don't call it pronounce it correctly, um, I, do, uh, I do acknowledge my German limitations, uh, but you talk about fragmentation of security, um, and I think from where I've seen in Nairobi and uh, also in Kampala, the, the idea of fragmentation is more fragmentation of governance as framed in a formal sense. So for the, 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 the let me call in this case, the, the poor or in most cases, those who live in the slums, they view governance by the state as more fragmented than their own way of governing. So I find that when we speak of fragmentation of security, uh, for them it's more fragmentation of governance. And it, the, the, the clear example here is that um, if you heard of a slum called Kibera, it's the largest slum in East and Central Africa, um, and that's a good, a good title in some ways, uh, because it attracts the UN every year uh, to go and take photos. Uh, but, but, but Kibera is also called the Republic, in that you, everything you want is found in Kibera. The people who provide security are also the people who provide water, and they're also providing electricity, and a lot of it is diverted from the formal structures. Because whenever they talk about the link between security and water provision and electricity, the police will say, well, if you want water, there's a Ministry of Water. Um, if you want electricity, there's Kenya Power and Lighting Company. Um, if you want this, there's this ministry. Um, but uh, for their lives, these things cannot be separated. Um, security, electricity is also means that uh, you are able to um, 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 be in darkness or light. And darkness sometimes can be the difference between security and insecurity. Uh, so you find that for them, the idea of what it means to provide security is not just uh, the idea of who controls violence but also the question of water, electricity, food, the price of commodities, um, 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 what you own, um, who is your neighbor, and all these things are seen as interrelated, are, as connected. And when they see the state, the state will say, well, you are an individual, you have your own rights, human rights and everything, water is this entity, electricity is that entity, food you have to buy, all those things. And they see the state as more fragmented than themselves, and so they rely on this networks of provision of social order because that allows them to live or to frame their idea of order in a way that they know and contact the state. Thanks, Joe. Wait, Volker, we'll still wait. <laughs> wow, it's so quick to go. I'll let you have right of reply, but I'd like you all in the next round just to consider this question. To what extent or are urban and non-urban or rural synonymous to s in some way with ideas of core and periphery? So I want you to have right of reply, Volker, but this is something in our leading discussions we sort of problematize the, the, what, what urban really means. So not to distract you from where you wanted to come back first, I mean, Volker. He's, he's going next, is he? <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, it, fascinating that uh, this slum is called the Republic. So. Obviously, there is some kind of a mimicking of state structures there. And uh, water, electricity, security are organized as a public good in the context of that republic. And this, again, means others are excluded from this. But it's an internal mimicking of, of state structures, in a way. And on the other hand, you have these gated communities in Nairobi, Port Moresby, wherever, where security is highly privatized and commercialized, and so you have to, you have to take into account that you have th these different poles. You might have squatter settlements uh, where this works pretty well, but you also have squatter settlements where it's more, more disparate, because people coming not from only one island or from one ethnic group, but uh, coming together from different islands and then having problems to, uh, to yeah, arrange, rearrange their relationships. Of course, this is ongoing all the time. 
but you also have then these new forces of commercialization and privatization that come in because people now want to make money out of the provision of security or water and electricity and it's not uh, just providing for your own people but also and I think this is where uh, these ideas of capital and labor also also come in also because uh, now there are new demands on uh, what a good life in an urban environment <coughs> is and this means that you have to make money in one way or the other and then then you have this this mushrooming of, of private security companies particularly in these uh, in these cities of, of the global and so south coming coming to uh, yes, uh, I, I think it di uh, I, I, I think I already m tried to make it clear when I talked about the diasporas in in Brisbane or Los Angeles or so. It does not make sense for these people to talk about uh, center and periphery, saying Brisbane and Los Angeles is the center, as we would uh, assume. But for them, the village and the island is in the center. So um, I, I think it's very much how you frame. Your, your own own identity and what kind of self-image you have. And last point uh, with regard to N, yes, these things can work, but only if you can reframe the group uh, that needs some kind of conflict resolution and provision of security as a we group. What do you do about the Chinese in Hunyara or in Bukan, Bougainville, or uh, the, the Vietnamese in Port Vila who somehow stay as the outsiders and foreigners, because this reframing as a we group always also needs these others. And in Buka, every now and then, the Chinese shops get looted by these people who come together across the divisions from uh, across the divisions. I'm I'm from from Siwai, I'm from Buin, but we all are against these bloody Chinese. Mm. All right. So so there are two things here. Both. <laughs> The centre and periphery and, and, and the sort of negative cast on fragmentation there. Uh, and, and, and they're related. I mean, I think it's, part, it's partly because we, um, we imagine the state and, and the globe, in a sense, according to these centre-periphery kind of dynamics and, and see the state as, as, as organised from the centre. And in a sense, I think, um, what I'm what I'm trying to re refer to here is a sense of um, the potential, f at least, for security, the provision of security and well-being through decentralised um, or more decentralised, multi-centred um, networks and webs. Uh, and I think the thing is, you s you see that happening in in, in various sites, um, urban and rural, uh, where Another way of putting it, too, is that the so-called peripheries can be saturated with the key, rather than the idea that it's at the centre, that the key issues of governance and security and so forth are, are sorted through. It's often um, villages or, you know, where, where these issues, these fundamental issues of how different groups are relating, how to sort out the relationship between, you know, uh, different forms of economic exchange or different forms of governance. People are working on those things all the time, uh, better or well. I mean, they, they, they work or they don't work. I'm not trying to suggest that they're always working, but, but people are engaging with these issues. Um, so, I mean, I think the, the whole distinction between centre and periphery is part of a whole imagination of the state that we have and that we may... I think we, of, we can see in certain places a reshaping of those ways of organising political community um, that, that are far more decentered. That's to give it a very abstract spin. Uh, and just to quickly pick up on, I don't think it is always, has, I don't think it always has to be according to an art group. And in fact, I, there, was a, there was a demonstration in Port Vila not long ago because a Chinese woman was killed. And, and, and the, 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 sta the statements on the street was she had been there, she lived most of her life there from their point of view. She was, she, you know, she was a local. She was a local. I don't think it has to work like that. It can work like that, but it doesn't always work like that. I think there are always people... This is another one of those issues. It's constantly being um, 
tussled over. They're, they're in play, these issues. They're not settled. So yes, one way of organising security is always through that outcasting, but there are people working against that. There are dynamics working against that too. And, and one of the things that strikes me um, repeatedly, certainly about Melanesian societies, is the preparedness to connect. You know, no matter how far you've gone, there's a preparedness to connect, it strikes me. And that's, that's I, I think the, the center periphery debate is interesting because if you look at it from the global south, then you can't omit the idea of colonization. Um, which was very, very um, um, core and key in the, in the emergence, of, emergence of what we may call the center, in that the, the center is made by the periphery. Uh, the, periphery uh, the center depends on the periphery for its own existence. Um, and there's a lot of the periphery in the center, and there's a lot of movement between the periphery and the center. And that owes itself to how the colonial uh, authorities, in most cases the British colonial authorities, uh, constructed um, the center, in that the center was a place whereby labor would come to contribute its, it, it, its fair share of the economy, and then the periphery where was where the agriculture or the families were being brought. I remember um, my, my uncle would come to our village once a year, the 21 days of leave. Um, the rest of the time, uh, he is in the center on the cities making money as, as a laborer in this, in this context. So you do find that over time, the language that is spoken in the center mirrors a lot of what the periphery is. Um, if you're in Nairobi, you find that some names of slums are actually names of villages in the village, in, in, actually in, in the rural areas. And so the periphery uh, has constructed the center to a point whereby at the moment, and with the globalization, globalization and everything, and movement of goods and services, and again, going back to labor and capital, the center builds the periphery one building, one block at a time. And at some point, no, so the, the periphery builds the center one block at a, at a time. And you find that increasingly, there's more closer connection between what is called the center and the periphery. Um, but more importantly, it is not geographical disconnection that matters more. It is the material connection um, that matters more, and that has gone on for a long time um, in the center periphery relationships. Okay. Thank, thanks very much all for those. I, I, I desperately want to get your thoughts on one last question, but this is going to have to be a really short, sharp answer. We're back to the beginning again. It's back to, back to the start. I want a kind of one minute response to this. But it is that final question I, I, I promised I would raise, um, which is what can we learn from all this, and how can it and should it inform the way that these outsiders, but as I was at pains to say at the start, I think it's also within the global south. I think governments and capitals are often complicit, if not the architects of some of this way of thinking as well. It's not entirely the guilt of the outsider in, in that sense. But nevertheless, what can be learned from these empirical realities you've, you've told us about and, and the, the examples you've given? What can be learned and how can that shape a different type of engagement? Unfair to ask you to answer that kind of question very shortly, but let's treat it as a stimulus to then open it up to the floor and get as much time as that as possible. So, Volker, perhaps we can start with you. Yeah, uh, we can learn forget about state building. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's not state building, but it's building linkages. That's, that's what's important. I think Bruce Baker said this, this first. And so uh, to try not to perceive uh, fragmentation, heterogeneity, uh, divisions, differences as obstacles for uh, a good life, for security, for social resilience, but to work with difference and to try to tease out what the positive elements of heterogeneity could be when you try to work across difference. And this does not only apply to rural areas, but this also applies to, to, to cities, and not only to cities in the global south, but I think also to cities uh, in, the, in the regions where we come from. Yes, I mean, I, I really endorse that, uh, just to sort of 
that, that phrase of Sinclair Dinan's also working with the grain of what local realities and moving away from the kind of strong dichotomies, the strong analytical dichotomies by which we structure, by which we structure so many of uh, our ways of understanding the sort of state, non-state, custom, non-custom, you know. That's, that's one set of things, but I also think we've got things to learn from a lot of other communities in terms of what we do here. And one of those things is um, habits of engagement, habits of building linkages. We, we do do that, of course we're always doing that, but I think we need to recognise that as a fundamental um, dimension of our, in, of our, in a sense, broader political engagement. You know, th this is how we make political community by the ways we engage uh, with each other, sort of not necessarily, it, it may be building trust, but it may even just be building patterns of exchange where we're prepared to listen to each other. That actually takes work and, con you know, you have to be conscious of that. And um, I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not saying we don't do that, but I just think in some societies that's a really constant pressure, as Joe was saying, um, security is, is a delicate thing that you're working at every day. Uh, I think we've got something to learn from that, that it's not, some, it's not something provided by people out there, it's also something we do as well. Thanks, Joe, I think, I think, Short, because I can go till, till tomorrow, but I think <laughs> the, the key question is learning, in terms of what you can learn, I'm reminded of the relationship between the external interveners and the local actors. Um, is it possible to tame a disorderly city? Um, I, I, every intervention that s seeks to support policing in most of global south seeks to tame that disorder that exists in a particular city, for example. And so you, now you have tanks in the middle of the cities uh, roaming, trying to bring order. And what it does in most cases is that it makes a number of the population increasingly escape that attempt to be tamed and re recreate alternative order. So I think instead of trying to tame a disorderly context, probably it's good to learn from it. Yeah. How do things work? How does security order provision of everything work in a complex city like, for example, Dhaka in Bangladesh or uh, Manila in the Philippines or Nairobi? How do things work? The other bit is that is there something that some rural or rather um, um, periphery can learn from the city. You find that the city is far more complex. And the question is, to what extent can the periphery borrow on the complex relationships that operate in the city that makes the city itself appear like almost on the verge of a crisis, but always stable all the time? Okay. Thank you all very much for all of that, yet yeah, there would be so much more you could you could offer. Hopefully some of it we can tease out in some, some question and answer. I'm gonna make a plea to you all, and I am I can do this because I'm the worst at doing what I'm about to ask of you. <laughs> I ramble on, I don't ever get to a question, even if there is one, maybe it never comes. Please, if you can make your interventions, your comments succinct, but also really try and think of the question that you really want to get these guys to respond to and, and trigger the conversation. We've got about 20 minutes. It would be great to hear from as many of you as possible. So let's take three in one go, and I beg, keep them short. Three. 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 Do we have any? Yes, OK. So uh, my question is simply, how does, how does this social resilience that comes through um, a community involvement, that the alternative securities, as you talk about, how does that interact with the democratic program of, say, the United States, but also, I would say, Australia? And where's the role for democracy in that uh, program of securitisation? Uh, thank you very much for very stimulating and exciting uh, discussion. Uh, following on, on uh, all your contributions, I couldn't help but recognizing this translocal pattern that exists between very specific communities. And even the positioning which, which Volker mentioned, uh, so that the periphery can be Brisbane or, or, or 
uh, Los Angeles, it also often can work other way around, where the whole positioning from local over there in Tana or wherever it might be becomes positioned to the community which gets established either in a slum or as, as a settlement out there somewhere. Um, that idea or, or that, that uh, translocal, uh, uh, these local, translocal practices in reality, um, in a way, confirm that the um, transnational fra uh, framework and uh, generally focusing on nation state structures or, sta or state structures which are nation states uh, does have its limits. So that framework and which completely uh, ignores or does not, is not able to see and capture and uh, uh, capitalize on these translocal connections. So my questions, which is very br vague and fluid, would be um, how we can, in a way, make this, these translocal connections and realities um, more reflect in policies, more reflect in, in, in the development policies, or even beyond that, how the, the we can bypass nation state structures to, to address some of these uh, potentials that are social uh, resilience. Thanks, Harry. Last one more. <coughs> I'll give it a shot. Um, it strikes me that the, a lot of the examples you were using come from countries where A, there's a strong connection to land or a connection to place, and perhaps weaker state interventions and <coughs> excuse me, and more of a sense of obligation, perhaps. Um, whereas thinking about lessons from the global south, um, perhaps in the global north, there's less connection to land for for most or place, um, and much more reliance on state for the resilience aspect of of, of society. So I just be really interested in your thoughts on to move away from state building but to focus on the 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 process and the difference and and and, and loving and enjoying that and encouraging that how do we get the governance um, it, here that's perhaps more focused on responsibility to be to feel more obligation to do that okay Great set of questions around relationship between community resilience and democratization and our interests of great powers and not so great powers. Um, Translocal practices, how do we see that influence and permeate into policy and institutional practices? And the last about maybe what does the global north have to learn and back home a bit back to what you said, Anne. It looks like you might want to start. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start, but I won't. It's, it's a really complex set of questions, um, so thank you. Um, in terms, just to start with, with your question, Georgina, about where democracy fits in, um, and in a way, touching on yours as well. I mean, one way of, you know, you could, in, in a certain sort of way, cast some of these discussions, if you in that format, as kind of forms of active citizenship, really. Um, uh, because in a sense, I'm, I'm talking about people being conscious that collectively they are responsible um, for each other, actually. And sometimes it may be very much in an in-group, but, but, but I, I, I would argue that it's often not only within an in-group, that people actually do often you know, there can be both dynamics in play. Sometimes you can only see your in-group or sometimes you can really be conscious of this mutual interdependency that's going on. And, and certainly, you know, your, your, your discussion um, actually reminded me of a workshop that a couple of us were at, at in Kumasi in northern Ghana where we were asking the participants um, what they see, saw as their major security challenge and a number of the participants were really very senior police. And they said their major security challenge was that there was an election coming up and they knew the politicians would start mobilizing groups to fight each other. And, 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 you, and basically a sort of, um, you know, a kind of political entrepreneurship that, that, that moved around populism and that that was their major security concern. So, do you know, um, so, I mean, I think there's lots of scope for a kind of genuine democracy in the sense of participation by people and forms of accountability. Uh, 
how it actually engages with the actual processes of electioneering and so forth can be quite different. You know, so there's a, a lot of complex stories in that question in a way, but I don't see it, I mean, I, I, I guess putting it at a very general abstract level, and I'm, I'm sorry for being so general and abstract so much, but I don't see that what is being put forward here is exclusive of participation, accountability, do you know those, those issues that we hold dear, it's just how do those issues get shaped in this, you know, as Joe was saying, paying attention to what is actually done. How, how do those issues get shaped in that context and then how do international bodies um, support that? If, they, if they're going to engage, how do they support that, as it were, rather than you know, do it via the tanks in the city, for example. Um, um, and, and Josh, sorry, to, but, but just to go quickly to Josh, I, I completely agree that our sense of what we owe each other has shifted hugely, and I'm not suggesting, I mean, I think it's fantastic we have these levels of um, public service provided by the state, and in a sense, it's almost um, we need to really value that as well. Um, I, I mean, in a sense, what I'm talking about is what we could learn is habits of dialogue and mutual recognition and mutual valuing. We need to value that, but we also need to see ourselves as responsible and engaged with each other, but also with those institutions. I mean, in a sense, I'm, I'm really trying to think of the state as not just those institutions, but as a whole network of forms of accountability and participation that we engage in and we're part of that and um, so do you know yeah we're more distant uh, but we don't need to be and you can see lots of small engagements that that city councils and and streets um, my uh, my street actually let me, let me I'm going on too long my street has recent my street not here but my um, my street um, in sort of semi-rural Queensland has recently had a big fire. The whole street has got together and is doing all this fundraising for the um, local community fire brigade. Um, do you know, these things happen all the time and I think it's seeing them, valuing them and building on them becomes really important. And sorry, I, I, won't, <laughs> I won't try, I've talked too much already. So. to um, um, just respond simultaneously to two questions, Georgina and um, uh, your name again is Harris. Um, and I might not be as clear as you expect, but um, there's an example of what happened um, um, where uh, in Kenya. So there was a devolution of power, in this case, empowering the locals uh, to determine their own destiny uh, in terms of how they utilize resources. So. We had a new, Kenya had a new constitution, and then um, they had 47 counties. Each county became a local government. Now, there's a one county, county called Turkana. It is in the remote areas. In fact, the, in 1966, uh, the government made, made a conscious decision that the resources will not be taken to Turkana because they, 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 there's no return. So it has been <coughs> marginalized for a long time. But after devolution, and resources going to the, the local people and people having their local assemblies and feeling empowered, there's more democracy at the local level. Um, now they're having what they call people's assembly, where they gather every time to discuss local issues. And this discussion is open to as many people as those who can attend. And what you realize is that the elections at the local level have become more competitive and less violent. At the national center level, the elections have become equally competitive and more violent. So you find that this People's Assembly has attracted an opportunity for that idea of who we are as a community to build into what it means to do governance, development, and policy making. And interestingly, um, now development actors are actually tapping into these ideas um, of People's Assembly to formulate policy. So for example, in one county, they had only one ambulance uh, for a whole county that's huge. But now, from People's Assembly, they decided to buy ambulances to actually move patients around. 
And uh, as a result of that, some development partners came to support that process by providing fuel, uh, supporting uh, renovation for drivers and everything. And so you have this idea that the locals are now feeling empowered. They're feeling that they have more chance to stake claim to particular ways of making policy. And the policy makers are tapping into this. Now, add that to the fact that there's, we are now living in a new media. So whatever is happening in one area automatically and immediately has spread all over the world. And so the government is feeling more afraid of doing the old stuff of dominating people and is now feeling more under pressure because there's that information empowerment and resource building from below, which again informs how now democracy has been localized. But more importantly, policy making is now responding to this localization of democracy. Yeah, with the democracy, that's really a tricky one, I find, because when you, when you go to, to communities in the Pacific Island countries, democracy and also human rights have a pretty bad name because it's perceived as being imposed from the top and from the outside. And when you then try to dig a little bit deeper, then you realize, yeah, but people talk about participation, about various forms of accountability, all these things that we would also uh, label as essential for, for, for democracy. Uh, they don't like the divisive elements of democracy. For instance, violence that is uh, related to elections. And uh, they, they, uh, the, 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 the perception is very much uh, these outsiders now force us to fight against each other in these elections and we would prefer our style of, of governance which is very much more inclusive, consensus oriented, which also can be perceived as being uh, a, an approach to a democracy. And in Bougainville they also have these village assemblies and they say, yeah, uh, we talk as long as it's necessary to reach consensus and then the decision uh, is really a decision of everybody. Of course, as an outsider, you can't really see. Is it uh, everybody really engaged in these de uh, decision-making processes, or at the end of the day, is it the old men uh, and, and the women and, and the youths marginalized? Uh, but even if uh, the women and youth, as far as I understand it, would always say, we don't want to get rid of these uh, forms of governance, but we want to have them developed further so that also the women and youth can have a voice in these processes of decision making. So they don't like this alternative. Either it's democracy and it's state or it is uh, custom and tradition and the non-state. And I think there is a lot of potential of bringing these things together in a homegrown way. And this is what they are working at, at in Bougainville at the moment. They, they are going to have this uh, referendum on independence in June 2019, and they have to establish something like a state as a member of the international community of states, and they have to have somebody at the United Nations and so forth. But what does this really mean with regard to the internal organization of governance and the democratic organization of governance is a totally different different is, uh, topic or issue. And they are working on it. And they are very engaged in working on it. And then um, the, the, the point is that we very much, when, when we go to the, uh, as interveners or development workers or whatever, go to the, um, to the global south, we still very much cling to this thinking in entities uh, as like the nation state, as, as, as you said. But when you look at what's going on in the European Union or in other um, parts of the global north, we are well beyond the thinking in the nation state as the central entity already. Why are we still saying uh, we have to have state building uh, for these backward people in, in the global south? Uh, so there is still, I think, this, this idea of progress modernization that you have to go through different stages. And I, I have come to doubt this very much. So uh, what, what's there on the ground is not the second best and only just uh, there until they have come to the stage of being proper states, but it is, has something in its own right. 
And also what we have in Australia and Germany is also something in its own right. I would never say uh, let's get rid of uh, this fantastic uh, state monopoly over the physical uh, legitimate use of, of, of violence in, in Germany or Australia because it has some, some advantages. Uh, I only want to make the, the point that this is not something that should be generalized and seen as the end of history, so to speak. Uh, and that it's also possible to find new forms of governance and security provisions under conditions where you have a relatively well-established uh, monopoly over the legitimate use of, uh, of physical force. Not to forget that this also sometimes has very, very negative effects for, for the citizens. Uh, look at my hometown, Hamburg, uh, with the G20 um, uh, riots and so forth and how the police behaved there. So, and, and this, this is also something that you always automatically think state institution, police courts and so forth um, apply to democratic uh, uh, principles and human rights and so forth and the others are always under the suspicion that they don't. But uh, if you really look at what's uh, actually going on, you can also have your questions, and it's good that in a democracy that's possible, you, uh, you can have your questions with regard to the performance of police courts and corrections and so forth. Okay, thanks, Volker. I want to really get back quick to get one more round of questions, but if I can add one thing. I think um, <coughs> perhaps in addition to what's been said, th perhaps the, the failures of wholesale state building enterprises may do the biggest work to make an argument for this. So, so where, where the points of connection are, I think have been covered quite nicely, but how you convince those states in positions of power and authority who like to see mirror images of themselves across the world in stable state system that they can prosper in. Um, actually, I think some of the lessons from Afghanistan and Iraq, but also across Africa and these wholesale state building projects will point in this direction. The, the risk that's worth raising, which we've, we've talked about in previous seminars, is that that becomes instrumentalized rather than engaged in a, in a genuine um, positive form of dialogical engagement that Anne described, actually the risk that this becomes instrumentalized. And in fact, we use this local to our advantage in the battle um, between certain political interests. I'll leave it at that because we should take three more questions nice and quick. Well, nice and quick, I'll stick with the Charlie Hunt tradition of starting with a story and forgetting the question. Um, and please don't, do, please don't uh, ever uh, apologise for being abstract in general, um, because the impact on some of us is quite profound. Um, the, my, I was thinking about when you were talking about um, so much of you know, resilience and thinking about peace focuses on how we deal with difference, but homogeneity is also a constant fixture in the discourse, even if it's perhaps p politically not popular to, to draw, you know, to draw it into analysis. And I was thinking back. Um, I was living in Dili for you know quite a number of years in East Timor, and the safest time I felt there was when I was living in an eth ethnically homogenous community. Um, and as people moved into that community who were of the same ethnicity, their own security became more pronounced. Their own sense of security became, became more pronounced because of that. Um, and uh, it was what I think happens in somewhere like Dili is that actually it's the breaking down of the homogeneity or a dysfunction in the reproduction of a sense of homogeneity of identity actually begins a project towards an, in, you know, an incite violence between different groups. But as long as those groups can ma maintain relative homogeneity within that sea of difference, then actually that's a reproduction of security and of a form of peace. So my question is, I mean, we focus so much on difference and negotiating difference, living with difference, overcoming difference, wherever you sit on that spectrum. My question is, but doesn't homogeneity actually have a role, quite a fundamental role, in reproducing social resilience, particularly in urban settings? Um, it's a pretty big question for the time we've got left, but I was just wondering if you could comment on um, how we can construct or alter um, or strengthen systems, so like health systems, education systems, um, to absorb the threats of um, socio-political volatility. Oh, 
Hi. Um, I'm going to ask something completely different. Sorry. Um, so I'm really interested in transitioning to a low carbon economy. So that's just a general question. Would that help? Or, ha or do you know about it? The transition towns across the globe that are looking at this together and they have a different form of governance. Uh, we're yeah. Is that enough? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. that's great. Okay. Thank you. Um, and that nicely, actually, in a tangential way, does bring in back these kind of questions of global processes, global forces and factors which feed into this, this local interface. So, Damien, the, the defense of homogeneity, like why throw out, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? Um, number two, can we, how do we absorb some of these threats in some of the public services like health and education? And lastly, whether it's low carbon and climate change related, but maybe the broader question of how does this globalization, globalizing processes, global factors interfere and interface with this? So you have one last word on the three questions and anything else you wanted to say. Okay. I'll <laughs> I know Joe is really keen on the first one, so I'll, I'll, I'll go first quickly. But... but um, I am not suggesting that uh, a sense, you know, it depends what you mean by homogeneity, really, but a sense of familiarity, a sense of belonging, um, uh, a sense of, you know, in a sense almost, you know, knowing your community, this is my community, I know how people are going to behave, that, that sort of sense. That's a really um, important part in, 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 in developing a sense of security, I think, collectively. Why I emphasise heterogeneity so much is that we need to deal with it constantly. It's a, it's a challenge and we need to learn how to deal with it. I'm not suggesting that, that, homogen you know, that, that a sense of belonging and, and familiarity is bad or a problem or not a place where um, feelings of security and realities of security are shaped. But we need to learn how to link across those uh, and we do, and I think, and a lot of communities do that really well. Um, that's just a really quick, I think Joe will build on that or do what is do something else with that. But the health, going quickly then to the health and, and other sorts of social, I mean, it's, it's going to depend very much on, on the context, on the environment, but, but and these are, this is a very general kind of response, but I think it's, it's also, it's how those institutions, you know, is it a hospital, is it a small health service, is, is, it, a, is it a mobile clinic, uh, how those institutions um, position themselves within the, the different communities that they're operating in. Uh, do they see themselves as isolated, professionalised and separate? I'm not saying they shouldn't be professional, I'm not, I'm not sort of... Um, or do they, ma do they, I, I mean, I think this point about maintaining relationships, maintaining conversations, even if it seems to be sometimes a waste of time, is not a waste of time. Uh, the, one of the marginalised, significant marginalised communities in that city of Kumasi that we were talking about before, I was talking about, one of the ways they felt marginalised was that there had been a number of infant deaths, you know, um, in, in the hospital with women giving birth and th that had been really badly, they felt, handled by the hospital and they had gone and blockaded the hospital and there'd been sort of... So those... And they felt that that institution wasn't responding to them, was it? And so I think the sort of constant effort to um, see health, for example, as not something that belongs in the hospital, that, but that belongs in the community and the hospital is interacting or that the, the medical service is interacting. So that's a very general response, but it's, it's again that point about maintaining relations, building connections, um, accepting difference, really. Um, and what was the third one? Um, low carbon economy oh, transitioning. Transitioning to a low carbon economy. I mean, uh, um, a lot of um, the communities that um, I might connect into are pretty, not all, you know, like, say in the Pacific, they'd be pretty low carbon, but not necessarily in terms of, say, some of the Ghanaian 
communities might be very high carbon actually because of um, coal and, and so forth. Um, I, I think uh, really there's a tremendous consciousness in some places, particularly the Pacific, about a whole series of environmental dynamics uh, and low carbon and, and there's a really, that, that's, a, that's an intense pressure point that, and there's, a, there's quite a high awareness from the elite level but also at quite a quite a um, you know ordinary people are conscious of 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 the dangers of climate change in particular uh, and um, I, th I think there'd be certainly be an openness to um, ongoing engagement in in, in discussion of, um, uh, with with people across the Pacific certainly about those about those issues and I think Volker would know more about that actually so Okay, great. Um, we're already over time. You're in the elevator with the Secretary General of the UN or whoever else you want to convince if your answer is right to these. So you've got one minute. I think I'll take only one question. Um, I want um, maybe two quickly. One, I agree with uh, Damien that uh, to some extent homogeneity has a role to play, um, especially in building um, resilience within communities. Um, and it certainly, if you live in Nairobi, then you realize that um, in the slum areas or the low socioeconomic areas, um, um, sl the names are organized alongside uh, ethnic uh, groups and everything. And that has its own uh, significance and its own relevance. Th there are two problems. One is that um, the homogeneity in that context is open to disruptions. Um, a lot of disruptions, marriages, um, mobility, people moving from being a low, low economic background to higher, which means they have to go to other places. And sometimes the city is always a place of mobility. It's always in motion. The city is always in motion. So if it's in motion, then it makes homogeneity difficult to hold for a long time. The second reason um, is that uh, homogeneity um, uh, sometimes has the problem of curtailing um, other forms of solidarity. Uh, so if you are from one ethnic group, and you are poor, and the other guys are from another ethnic group and they are poor, you're equally poor. So it kind of like curtails the opportunity for people who are socially deprived to work together to form solidarities that can help them um, resist certain forms of power and, and authority that they don't like. So if you are in Kibera and somebody is in, in, in Mugumoini, for example, and you are different ethnic groups, homogeneous, if you are seeing yourselves as stable because you are different, uh, there's opportunity of you being stable by being together as people from low socioeconomic background. Quickly on the issue of uh, carbon, I, I think the potential for the periphery uh, to move towards low carbon is high, except they don't have the power to resist capital, um, the power to resist expansion in the economic sense, uh, where you find that, for example, in East Africa, uh, they are now opening coal stations and uh, drilling oil everywhere because the, the idea that coal and oil bring development and modernization and, 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 and progress. So while they have the capacity to live in this low carbon um, process for a long time, they can't resist the power that comes with capital and the whole sorts of who is modern and why and, and how. Last word. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, homogeneity. Uh, yes, and of course, uh, it's not uh, just by, by chance that people in Port Vila try to live together in their Tana community or their Ambrim community or in Buka as Sivais or Buins or so, because this provides them security. But as uh, Joe said, uh, in an urban environment, you have the, all these issues of intermarriages and uh, trying uh, need, uh, the need to work together in, a work for, uh, in the workplace and so forth. So homogeneity is nothing that you can rely on for uh, the future. It's not static, but you have to engage with all these challenges that come uh, with living together with others in an urban environment, in an urban urban space. Um, the, the education and health thing, so I always have a little bit of, uh, I feel sometimes uncomfortable with these dis uh, discussions that we have because there is uh, very easily the danger to let the state off the hook 
because we all talk now about communities and what the communities can do and so forth. But uh, I think there are also responsibilities that stay with the state and that one has to put forward these demands. And uh, I, I don't want to, to have our discussions go in the direction of a Trump or neoliberal state, state light. And, and, and we have to, have to be very careful, careful at this point. Uh, with the, the climate change and the low carbon and so forth, uh, why are the cities in, in the Pacific Island countries growing, rapidly growing? Uh, one of the um, important push factors is climate change, sea level rise, people being forced from the outer islands to the capital cities. Of course, there are other pull factors and so forth, but this push factor is an important one. And on the outer islands, these people often live subsistence lifestyles which do not really contribute anything to, to, to climate change. But once they are forced to live in a place like South Tarawa, which is the capital city of Kiribati, things of course change. And, and, and South Tarawa is, is, uh, has a population density of Hong Kong. So, so it's, it's really, a, although there are only like 60 or 70,000 people uh, living there, but it's a really urbanized, urbanized environment. And people can't do much in that context. And I think the responsibility with regard to, to these issues very much lies with us here in, uh, now I use the, the, the term, the, the center or, or the, uh, in the metropole. Okay. We definitely don't have any more time for anything else. Heterogeneity exists. Deal with it. Not necessarily allow it to take over, not allow it to be the be all and end all, but hopefully deal with it constructively, genuinely, perhaps dialogically, with a level of engagement that we don't see in current approaches. That may be the only uh, thing we have time to say to wrap up. What does remain to be said is a big thank you from me to everyone who helped us put the seminar on. This is going to be the short version. Certainly to our three panelists, to Joe, to Anne, and to Falke for their f fascinating insights and wonderful engagement and even occasional disagreement. Thank you to you all for coming and for your participation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you haven't heard enough from these fine people, then I have a plug for a book which is about to be published, which, <laughs> lucky for us all, addresses these issues. It's called Exploring Peace Formation. It will be released later, uh, early next year. Um, you can find out a lot more in that. Um, and last but not least, um, a call, a plea to engage with us further, not only us, but our centre uh, through our, our website, our Facebook page, um, and the future Global Friction Seminars, which hopefully will continue into next year. Uh, we're here, we're interested in, in your engagement, whether that's the students through our research programmes in the school, uh, t teaching and research within the school, postgrad programmes and things like our Global Friction series. So thank you all, and thank you to our panelists.